If you are here, you have taken an active role in bettering your life, no matter what stage of life you are in. The Banyan Treatment Center's podcast will discuss many topics like recovery, addiction, self-help, mental health, and so much more. It will provide you with tools to succeed, ideas for recovering, and how-tos on creating a better life. My name is Alyssa, and today's episode is about the deceptions of mommy wine culture. Today on our panel, we have Nicole Monaco, a missions representative for Banyan and a person in long-term recovery. Nicole is an advocate for mothers who struggle with the deceptions of mommy wine culture because she found herself victim to it as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, thank you for having me. My name is Nicole. I am a mother of two beautiful children. I have a daughter, Dylan, who is 15, almost 16. Wow. And I have a son who is 11 years old. And I am a wife of one to my husband, Dan. And we live here right in Lake Worth. Well, I'm so happy that you're here with us today to talk about this topic. I'm excited to dive in. Mommy wine culture is globally recognized as the acceptance or association of jokes around the idea that mothers deserve a drink, usually glasses or bottles of wine, after battling the daily stresses of being a mother. Although there is no official or medical definition for this terminology, mommy wine culture is heavily supported and promoted by the media. It has been popular to share images or comedy sketches on both TV and social platforms representing this phenomenon. Even though the wine mom trend was not created to hinder the specific community, but rather designed to go against society's perception of a perfect mom, it has led to dangerous ramifications. Today we speak about the effects of mommy wine culture and provide tips on safe ways to combat the difficulties that come with motherhood. All right, let's first start off with really diving into what mommy wine culture is. What do you consider some examples of mommy wine culture? Well, we can start off with, we've all seen it, the t-shirts, mm-hmm. the, the uh, swag, which is like the koozies or the wine glasses, mugs. Um, then you can dive into, you know, just the names that are given. Mommy juice. Yep. Um, mommy therapy is a big one. Um, and, you know, wine time. I had a t-shirt which sounds ridiculous now, but I sported it like no other. Um, It was, in fact, I think that it was a gift from my kids. It said, run now, wine later. Wow. And when you think about it, how ridiculous is that? Mm -hmm. So you're going to exercise in the morning and be healthy, and and then it's wine time. You're going to need to drink and, and cope with your day you do feel depleted of yourself because you just grew a body inside yourself. Yeah. You're giving everything you have to a newborn child or, and then continual into toddler. Into, so you're, you're giving, you're giving, and then you have like this big alcohol telling you, you know, gimmick, money, you know, they're trying to tell you, here, you're going to be part of a group. Like we all do this. Right. Here, 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 here. And then, you know, society is like, yeah, no, you can do it all. You can do this. And then the reality is there's no way a person can do that and and not become addicted to a highly addictive drug, Mm -hmm. the most addictive of all. And the problem with it is that it's legal and it's everywhere. So people look at it as like, what's wrong with you? Like Mm -hmm. everybody is anybody drinks. You can't handle your liquor. How can you be, you know, so dependent on alcohol? Well, the alcoholism is so normalized. It's encouraged. It's encouraged. And um, my sister has this saying, like, I don't drink if I'm having a bad time. I only drink if I'm having a good time. Because when you're drinking that you're having a bad time or you're using it as a coping skill, that's when the addictive behaviors started to come in because you're not dealing with your stress in a healthy way way. Right. You're coping with alcohol. You're mm-hmm. masking it. And it's so true. I mean, there's so many women out there that, you know, they'll tell you, oh, I can't wait to put the kids to bed so I can cork that bottle of wine open and I can relax. I can finally relax for the day. Yeah. I was guilty of it. Mm-hmm. I felt for every scheme, every gimmick, I I wanted that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, yeah. Wine time? Oh, wine at a play date? Sure. Oh, okay. You're like me. That's great. For someone like me who had issues mm-hmm. already in the past with alcohol 
And then to get that, I always say it like, to hear that excuse, that's all an addict needs. Yep. To hear that excuse, oh, what, we're calling this mommy wine culture? Okay. I'm in. <laughs> I, I'm in. What's, what's this? What's this mommy wine culture thing? It's saying it's okay to drink wine during the day? Okay. And, you know, it, it's acceptable. It's, and it's, it's everyone. Mm-hmm. It's not, that's the thing. That's what's so toxic about it and so dangerous because, and it comes on quick and it's, at first, okay, you know, like everybody drink, and then you become dependent. So if you're drinking for everything, good, bad, you know, and then it eventually becomes, you're just, you're numbing feelings, yep. period. There are no feelings. Mm-hmm. There, you're just numbing, numbing, numbing. You're not even feeling anymore. And your brain just becomes habitual to that. And that's when it becomes dependency and it becomes a true addiction. Yeah, absolutely. And what you're saying to so many people in early recovery, that's like the number one thing that they'll say in, in treatment. They raise their hand. How am I supposed to go to a birthday party? How am I supposed to go to this event? How am I supposed to go to oh, a wedding? Yeah. Like you're supposed to drink at these things. As a person with 11 years sober, I can promise you, you don't have to drink at any of those things and you can still have a really good time. Yeah. The alcohol, like sure, maybe if I could handle it res- appropriately, Maybe it would be a nice little, you know, addition to those events, but I don't need it. And I'm so happy and I still have a great time. And, you know, it's something that people worry about so much, but the longer you're in recovery and the more you experience these situations and you realize that you can get through them sober, you build that confidence up. Why do you believe the normalization of mommy wine culture is considered toxic? Are there health risks that we should fear? Yeah, starting with the disguise, Mm -hmm. right? So we were talking about earlier just how how it kind of snowballs and how it's tied up in a pretty bow and you know it's it's normalized and the fact that then you it's inevitable this is what i always say so you expect me to drink a highly addictive substance and not become addicted to it yeah and then you're going to try to slap you know you're an alcoholic and need to, you know, go away and get treatment and you're like, you know, then you're ostracizing, like you're different. Yeah. And it's, it, that's what got me. That's almost what, you know, that was the real thing that got me when I started trying to get dive into this and the real stuff. I was like, it's, it's so crazy. It's, it's one of those things where like, you know, like big pharma or big alcohol, Mm -hmm. Puts that there, puts the sickness out so that they can treat you for it. And then, you know, so you're, of course, you're going to become addicted. Yeah. Of course, you're going to become dependent on this. So it's toxic because it's disguised in everybody does it. It's everywhere. It's legal. We can get it at CVS. Yep. And and then with the health risks, I mean, so many, especially for me, you know, I'm 46 years old now. It was okay, are you going to continue to do this? Now you're starting to, my blood pressure was getting very high. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about, you know, just the, you know, your look in general. I, I always say I was like a bloated version of, of me. Like she's inside there, but you know, your appearance, I was like a grayish color. Um, that's, that's physically, I mean, mentally, we were talking earlier. I did some a lot of research on the brain chemistry and and what I mean. You're you are not thinking. Your your reaction time. Your everything is mm-hmm. so hindered. And if you are binge drinking, like drinking every day, um, you're you don't have time to get back to. You're literally hung over, and you're in that state. Yeah. As much as you think, okay, I'm okay. Like. I don't have a hangover. I didn't have hangovers by the end of my drinking career. I didn't even, I could have, I could have drank in a whole bottle of vodka. I, st- I didn't get a hangover the next day because my tolerance had become so high mm-hmm. that you do, you wake up and you're, you think that this is it. Like this is life. This is how I feel. Yeah. Oh, so I feel like slow. I feel sluggish. 
But this is this is how you feel, right? And you become accustomed to the way that you're feeling. You don't even realize that you're sick. You don't realize. Yeah. And that's the scary part about alcoholism. That's the scary part about alcohol. So, I mean, I know this is pretty obvious because we've been talking about it, but did mommy wine culture play a role in your alcoholism? Oh, heavily. <laughs> I would say yes. I would be the billboard for it. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Look, I'm but, the poster child. Yeah. Anti-mommy wine culture. And again- we can say I had said earlier, I, it was an excuse. Yeah. Really? Like I had an issue with that. I loved to drink. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is what we're doing. I have, I fit the bill. I'm a mom. I have young kids. Um, I'm, you know, I'm in the, in the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I taught half the children in the community. I know so many people, you know, I've been here for over 20 years. I'm like perfect for it. Let's, let's go have lunch and have drinks by the beach. Yeah. And, um, you know, the kids can be around too and, and everybody's into it. It's not like someone's like, so then when you do become sober, you know, when I stop drinking, those people, they, they don't talk to you anymore. Yep. You know, it's like kind of, and I found, talked to many people who are the same as me, you know, stop drinking and they, they say the same thing. It's don't feel, you know, it's kind of like they're taking a look in the mirror at them themselves. And I, I've, I've put a post out on Instagram and Facebook saying like, you know, along the lines of this is a hundred percent about me, not about you. I would never I am the last person to judge. I would never, because I think people feel like, oof, like I, I, I can't talk to you anymore. Like you're looking at me and it's like, no, no way. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging. I'm just, it's okay to reevaluate what's not working for you. Yeah. It's 100% you're right. And as we get older, I think it's, it's needed. You have to. Like, I can't imagine still drinking the way I was four years ago now with all the things I have going. The kids are older, the, 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 uh, the the sports, the events, the just everything. I might have even had more back then, but it's so, you're so wrapped up in your addiction that you almost, it's sick, but you almost put more on yourself because you're trying to be this perfectionist because you know you have this secret yeah. and this this other thing going on. So you're like, well, I, I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to wake up. I, I go to work all day. I come home. I make dinner. I, I take them to sports. I do all this. That's my reward. Right. I get to do this. And, and you can't judge me about it. Yep. And then the stress comes and the anxiety and the all of it. Whereas like, it's just, it just spiraled. And I think back and I'm like, wow, I was in a living hell of like this hamster roller coaster, uh, this hamster wheel going, which, which end is up? Like, yeah, you're like purposely flooding yourself. So you have the perfect it's self-sabotage. To, mm-hmm. It's you really complete- hit the nail on the head though. When it comes to other people, it's like, they see you trying to work on yourself and say, I'm not going to do this anymore because it was unhealthy for me. And it forces them to look at themselves and they don't want to look at themselves. Oh, it's scary. So they're like, you know what? We're just going to, we're just going to cut this out because they, they want to continue with the excuses. Like you're saying, they want to be able to say, okay, I do X, Y, and Z. I deserve to have this. So was there anything that happened that made you really identify this is a problem I need to stop? Uh, Yes. Aside from um, you maybe knowing it in the back of your head. <laughs> I was going to start with that. I was going to start with, let's go back even 15 years mm-hmm. where I was, which I didn't know this term. And now we know so- sober curious. Yeah. I was always envious of like, oh, wow, they're sober. I mean, you and my, uh, you for an example, mm-hmm. you, my brother, I worked in treatment. I wasn't drinking like I was at the end, you know, right. this is 10 years ago, but I was still drinking and I was watching what was happening at work. And I was talking to parents of, of people that were in treatment and I was sober curious. And at the time I, I didn't know that that was a word. And I could always remember being envious, like, you know, they, they, 
they fought this. They got over this. I still drink and I still do this, that. So as far as back as 10 years ago, I was would say I, I knew there was an issue. Yeah. And then I guess I got lucky in the way of COVID. Really, that's when it all came down because, you know, we were in the house. I didn't have those responsibilities of, okay, well, I have to get up no matter what. Yep. I have to go to work because I didn't have to go to work. I was teaching at the time at the elementary school. So you were teaching remote. And I wasn't even in the beginning. Yeah. I wasn't even teaching remote. We had completely shut down. And then, yeah, the kids were home. Um, there was nowhere to go. And I was drinking. That's when I said enough is enough. It was, it was, it was overload. And it made me start to think, okay, I found out real quick that I am a person that does not like to be told what to do <laughs> in that period of time. I don't like other people. Like I didn't want to hear this side or that side, what we should be doing how I should be covering my face, what I should, and I made my own decisions there. And I think that that drove me to investigate big alcohol and mommy wine culture. And I started to go, wait a minute, you are blessed to be a mother. Literally, I had to flip the switch. You are literally letting a liquid substance take over your life? Are you out of your mind? Yeah. You fought way too hard in this world to get what you exactly what you wanted. Most days I was a five out of 10. Good days, I would say I was a six out of a 10. That is no way to function. Yeah. That is no way to live your life for your kids and your family. And finally said, nope, no way. I'm changing everything. I got furious at alcohol. Like, how dare you? You've taken so much from me. Yeah. You know how you always have a picture of yourself? Like in that, I have a flash and it's me. I'm five years old. I'm going to kindergarten and I actually have the picture and it's me waving. I'm standing on the bus. I always think back because I remember that as kind of like my first memory. I was scared to death. I was always nervous. I was scared. I didn't want to leave my mom. I was one of those kids. And I did not want to go to school. And I, oh, I, I, my grandmother gave me that picture and I always look at it because I go back to it and go, okay. And I did it this time. This girl, she didn't want to go to school. She was so, I was crying, sobbing too, <laughs> leaving my mother. I was, I had to be the biggest pain in the ass. Neither <laughs> one of my kids were like that. And I think I would have, I, I, I would have died if they were. I was clingy. I didn't want to, I didn't sleep over people's house. No, I didn't leave my mother. And I put that in a frame and I put it in my bathroom and it's, and it's in a frame that says uh, something, I think it says you can do this. I think that's right. No, you got this. And it's in there. And I had, and I look at that every day and I say, she did it. And every day I do it for her. She was scared shitless going to school, leaving mom. She did it. When I say paralyzing, when I used to think of the thought of never drinking again, paralyzed me, yep. uh, crippled me. Like, I can't. You know, it's the same story. I'm no different than anybody else. So how did alcoholism affect the relationship with your family at home? It definitely affected the relationship with with everyone. Mm-hmm. With, uh, like I said earlier, I wasn't operating on, you know, all cylinders. Yeah. I was, I was at, you know, a, a six and we, as a growing family have had things to do. We're growing We yeah. we should. And I was still, you know, and that doesn't work for anyone. This is the other thing I find with this whole mommy wine culture is you're, you're, you're giving, you're supporting and, and, and try, this gimmick is to mothers who we need to be completely sober and make the right decisions for our family. We're the, we're, we're the mothers. Yeah, you're the glue that holds everything together. And uh, Right. And if you're, you're addicted to a substance, if you're not running on all cylinders, you're making bad decisions. Yeah. It's just going to happen. As hard as you try and think. I mean, I, let's be honest. I thought everything was fine. Yeah, no, we're good. 
I mean, because you don't know what's better. And now knowing and living, like I said earlier, I can't imagine still being in, you know, in addiction like I was. Yeah. So what do you do now as far as coping skills when you're having a tough time? Because obviously motherhood is challenging. It's it's difficult. This is why people start drinking wine to cope with it. What are some healthy ways to cope it, cope with it? I would say, and I had started this early on in, in, in my sobriety, I never took time out for me. So I started doing some me time, exercising, at least getting that walk out. I found groups online with like-minded people. Instead of the mommy wine culture, I turned to Sober Moms Club is one of, one of the many groups because it's a group of moms. And I always say I went from mommy wine culture to the Sober Mom Club. And there's more and more people joining this sober moms group. Men too. My husband now is sober. Oh, wow. Um, he doesn't drink. So we are teaching our children instead of the other thing. Now we are a sober household. And I'm, I'm, I hope that I'm teaching my daughter that the cycle ends with, with me, you know? No, I love that. Um, and it, it's so crazy. Like when you're in it, mommy wine culture is your life. You don't realize that there is a whole other world out there that's supporting the opposite of that until you actually start seeking it. So offering these resources right now, I think is going to be super helpful for listeners. And then also you see that a lot too, that, you know, households become sober, you mm-hmm. know, and, and your kids will notice it. And they're, they'll, they see that you're at a hundred percent now. They see how happy you are. They see the sparkle come back in your eyes, you know, yeah. and it, it makes an impression on them, especially if they've seen one side to the next. So how does it feel to be a sober mom? Uh, it feels wonderful. We can go back to, like I said, I mean, the thought was crippling to me and now being on the, of never drinking again and now being on the other side. When you're numbing yourself for so long and using that and not even knowing that you're, you got caught up in it, yeah. you know, almost being unaware and then it just spirals and you're like, oh my goodness. Now being on the other side, it's like almost feeling things again. And I, I my husband makes fun of me. I call it the returning. <laughs> I always hashtag the returning because I feel like I'm going back to that girl again. Like yeah. the one that was was happy. Her childhood was great. I was happy. I was there wasn't any cares. There wasn't anything. There wasn't I wasn't numbing feelings of feeling bad. Life is hard. Yeah. Everybody goes to work every day. Everybody has a shitty boss. Everybody has it. It's, it's not just you, Nicole. And you were using this excuse. Well, I need a drink because. And now it's like I'm feeling the only way to feel those feelings is through, the, you know, feeling them like I used to. And I used to write about it. And like, and now I'm coming back. It's it's almost like finding myself again. Being sober has brought me so much joy. Yeah. But on the other hand, I cry so much, which I love. I feel it. So what? I feel angry. I'm an angry little person. (laughs) And now I feel the anger, losing my mind. I love a good cry session. Like I live for that. Happy? I'm I'm happy. I'm I'm letting my kids know I'm happy. We're having fun. Oh my gosh, I have like time to like actually sit and talk to my kids, play a game. I, me and my son have an ongoing Uno game. It's on the kitchen table, <laughs> you know, and we're we're like, you know, writing it down and he's beating me, I'm beating him and we I don't give in and he doesn't either. We're hardcore. <laughs> and we got the we got the, you know, the list right there our wins and loses. I wasn't doing any of that. What what was I, where was I? That's the other thing I'm thinking. I'm like, I don't even, off in La La Land, who knows? But now I'm, I'm present. I'm feeling it. I'm present. I'm there. And it makes all the difference. You know, anyone who's listening to this podcast and, and knowing that my suggestion and what I feel is like reevaluate. It's okay to take a look and see, okay, is is drinking like bringing the drama on and disturbing my life and my family? Let, let's see the other options. Let's see. And especially to people, I talk to people all the time. Yeah. They're, they're definitely how I was, sober curious. And they ask me. I get inboxed all the time because I'll put 
stuff out on my Instagram, like everyday struggles, whatever. I, I keep it documented. And they inbox me like, okay, so give me some tips. How did you do it? You know? And I just, I just tell them how I did it. A lot of reading. It's good to know you're not alone. That's the main message that, you know, I'm trying to get out there. You're not alone. You'll never be alone. But if it's a problem, it is your problem to solve. We're here to help, you know, and it's okay to reevaluate. It's okay to not keep going in this cycle. It's okay to fight back. And until you fight back and realize that you're going to stay still and, and not get the help you need. No, I love that. And, you know, at the end of the day, if somebody needs additional help, you know, there are resources out there. You can call Banyan. Maybe you need to detox from the alcohol and that's okay. Do whatever you need to do to take that first step to get better because we're all here waiting for you on the sober side and you know we're happy to tell you that life is beautiful and you can have everything you want and more you know it all takes is that that first step i agree we're here for you well thank you so much for joining me today it was so great seeing you again it was it was a pleasure it was so great catching up it was my pleasure i had so much fun today thank you Alyssa. well we hope you enjoyed today's episode remember that growth and recovery are possible and it can all start today Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Banyan Treatment Centers and make sure you're subscribing for notifications of new episodes. And please don't forget to leave us a review. If you or someone you know are struggling, call us today at 888-515-7706. Thanks for joining us today on the Banyan Podcast. Podcast.